So, just after I turned 18, when I was old enough to go out dancing, I remember my nana being shocked by the fact that I didn't know any of the standard dancers, like the foxtrot, or the tango, or the waltz. I'm pretty sure she thought that I wouldn't be prepared to go out dancing or something. Anyway, one day, curiosity got the better of her, and she asked me, how do you dance when you go out with your friends? I sort of paused for a moment, and then started moving my body awkwardly, as if I were out dancing. And then I responded somewhat unconvincingly by saying, well, I guess we sort of just jump up and down to the beat. She met this with a blank stare. The look on her face said it all. The weirdest thing of all is that as an 18-year-old, I wasn't really into dancing. But for some reason, I continued to go out with my friends for the sole purpose of dancing. Or in my case, I continued to pay $20 entry to a grotty little club so that I could jump up and down to a beat with a bunch of sweaty strangers for hours on end, in heels. Weird, hey? Fast forward about 10 years, now into my career as a music therapist and researcher, this unconscious motivation to move to the beat is so much bigger than I first realised. In fact, it's the basis of my research in stroke rehabilitation. The World Health Organization has identified stroke as the leading, one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. Worldwide. This is huge, as stroke does not discriminate. Over the past five years alone, I have worked with stroke survivors who are great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, adults, young adults, teenagers, children. I have worked with stroke survivors who were at the lowest point of their lives at the time of their stroke and stroke survivors who were at the peak of their career. Stroke does not discriminate. Now, the worldwide prevalence of stroke is one in six. This means that on a global scale, one in six of us will experience a stroke in our lifetime. That's about 15 million of us each year. And stroke doesn't just impact the survivor. It has a huge effect on their loved ones, too. That is why it is incredibly important for every single one of us to learn more about it. A stroke is actually caused by an interruption of blood flow in the brain. This interruption stops the access of oxygen to certain parts of the brain. And as the brain is the control centre of our entire being, our functional abilities are compromised. Perhaps think about it like this. I want you to picture a beautiful flower, any flower that you like, a single flower in a pot of dirt. Every day, you water the flower, you give it sunlight, you check to see how the leaves look, the stem, the petals. You check to see that it's not drooping, and if it is, you might immediately give it some more water or sunlight, thus reinvigorating the flower, allowing it to beautifully bloom again in the open air. Now, imagine that that flower is placed in a dark room and it is covered with an airtight glass cylinder. The flower is now deprived of sunlight and oxygen. Up until this point, the flower has never experience such conditions. The flower wilts, the flower dies. When someone experiences a stroke, this is what happens in the brain. The part of the brain where the stroke occurred ultimately dies. As a result, the survivor might have difficulties with their ability to communicate, with their memory, expressing their emotions, or, in the large majority of cases, their coordinated movement. 
There is now research to indicate that 88% of stroke survivors will have one-sided weakness in the body, from the mouth all the way down to the arm and the leg. 50% of these survivors will have long-term loss of their arm and hand function. Long-term loss. Think about how much you use your hand in your everyday life. To bathe yourself. To dress yourself. To eat. To drive. To use your phone. To pick up your children. To hug your partner. Now imagine that that ability is gone overnight, forever without any warning. How would that make you feel? Well, for one third of stroke survivors, it results in depression. We now know that even after experiencing something as traumatic as a stroke, the brain has this incredible ability to rewire itself. If the stroke survivor engages in repetitive exercises of the same movement, there is potential for them to create new pathways in the brain. There is potential for them to regain some movement that was lost. So how do you motivate someone to exercise their weak hand whilst they are consumed with depressive thoughts? You don't ask them to do things that you know they cannot do at this point in time. You work with their strengths. You show them what they can do, and you do this with music. Music therapists draw upon the cueing of movement using person-centered music. We might play a series of ascending notes going higher and higher in pitch if we want to encourage the stroke survivor to practice raising their arm, thus increasing their strength and range of movement. We might even use a strong beat to cue a specified movement, thus increasing their repetitions of the exercise, leading to mastery. And we might even make music together, exploring different instruments based on their abilities, making music that knows no bounds. Approaching my work as a music therapist in stroke rehabilitation, I constantly come back to one concept, Entrainment. Say it with me, everyone. Entrainment. Entrainment is just a fancy word for synchronizing. That's what I felt all those years ago when I was 18 years old. That's why I kept going out dancing, even though I didn't really like it. My body was in training to the beat, moving with all the people around me, and it wasn't even a conscious process. And this is key to empowering and encouraging stroke survivors to stay motivated throughout their difficult rehabilitation journey. A couple of years ago, I learned something that completely floored me. Stroke survivors who have some presenting abilities in the hand are generally prioritized higher than stroke survivors who have no ability, no function, no movement. This was the opposite to what I thought should be the case. It seemed that the rationale came down to funding and resources. If the stroke survivor had some presenting movement in the hand, then they were likely to achieve something. Progress. However, if they had no presenting movement, well, I guess that's that. It just didn't seem fair. I decided that my mission from then on was to find a way to include all stroke survivors in active hand rehabilitation, regardless of their presenting abilities. I decided to focus on working with stroke survivors who had limited to no functional ability in the hand because I didn't want them to get left behind. I wanted to give them more options. I wanted to give them hope. So, Working with my manager at the time, Anna Barlow, we combined accessible music making with a routinely used form of electrical stimulation. In using electrical stimulation, we could target the heaviness of the hand and get the machine to raise the wrist up. 
Once up, I positioned an iPad in front of the hand and asked the stroke survivor to explore whatever movement they had. Time and time again, stroke survivors were able to do this after having zero movement literally moments earlier. Sometimes the hand would rest on the iPad and we'd hear note changes. The instrument was so touch sensitive that even the subtlest of flickers of muscle activation could be heard. So, uh, with others, it would start with a quiver of a finger and sometimes the whole wrist would move. They talked about feeling motivated by the sound that they were producing and the fact that I was accompanying them on the guitar, thus in training to their movement, meant that we had longer periods of active hand rehabilitation. And there was more smiling and positive reflections about their abilities. The stroke survivors started to focus on what they could do, not what they could not. My most memorable sessions are when the survivors say, I forgot I was in hospital for that hour. Because, let's face it, no one wants to be a long-term hospitalised patient who relies on others to even just go to the toilet. The interesting thing about music is that it's actually processed in both hemispheres of the brain. If there is damage in one hemisphere, music can actually help by compensating. So, by encouraging the stroke survivors to make music on the iPad-based instrument as part of their rehabilitation exercises, they were engaging the brain in something called audio-motor coupling. Instead of just looking to activate the motor part of the brain where the damage occurred after the stroke, they were also activating the auditory part of the brain at the same time. They were activating two parts of the brain at once in a way that forced each part to constantly talk to one another. Messages from these two parts of the brain were firing across information, increasing the potential for a rewiring of damaged areas. Recently, I worked with a young stroke survivor who was only 32 at the time of his stroke. 32. He lived with his partner and was working full time. He had a history of pretty severe migraines and after many appointments was scheduled to receive brain surgery. One of the risk factors of this surgery was the potential for a stroke. Nine hours after surgery, that is exactly what happened. The stroke left him with extreme weakness to his left arm and leg. He required a wheelchair. He became heavily reliant upon the people around him. I first met him when he was in the rehabilitation phase of his treatment. He seemed keen to work together, however said, I don't know anything about music. The best thing about music therapy, though, is that you don't need to have a musical background to engage. I shared this with him and we started sessions the very next day. I think that I was more nervous than him. He was pretty close to my age, really independent, loved sport, was super active, and I guess it all just felt too close to home. We started by looking at the different instrument options to play on the iPad. We then put on the electrical stimulation device and explored the instrument together. He had some movement, just as I knew he would. We then started making music together, improvising. He'd choose an instrument on the iPad and I'd accompany on the guitar. His fingers and hands started to do more than either of us realised he could. He was sliding his hand, he was lifting his finger, he was smiling, he was laughing. His partner, sitting there beside him, seemed to have tears in her eyes as she watched over. Now, seeing his strengths and abilities, we tried for another task. For him to move his finger in time with an auditory cue, a metronome. I'd sing the instruction, up, two, three, hold, down, two, three, relax, in time with the metronome as he lifted and lowered just one finger. 
Before we knew it, he had done this about 15 times. His movement was perfect. He was in sync with the metronome as he lifted and lowered just one finger. A week went by and we stopped using electrical stimulation. He became strong enough to do the movement on his own. It was at that point that I offered him to perhaps learn an excerpt of a song. And to my surprise, he already knew what song he wanted to learn. Talk by Coldplay. We spent the next few weeks learning this song with his weak hand. Initially, he said, there's no way I can do this. He also seemed to fatigue quite quickly and seemed down at these moments. Him, like many other stroke survivors, would question, why am I so tired after doing so little? But what seemed like a little to him was actually a lot. By repetitively raising and lowering even just one finger, he was creating new pathways in his brain. At these moments, I would look at him and say, you are rewiring your brain, literally. The weeks went on and he started to share more about his stroke journey. The good, the bad, and the frustrating. And as we neared the end of his impatient stay, he shared and reflected upon how far he had come. When attempting to play the excerpt of the song one last time, his partner and brother cheered him on. He did it, he accomplished it, and he was so proud. He said that to him, it felt like a team sport. His partner then shared her beautiful connection with the music of Coldplay, back when he was in surgery a few months prior. She shared how she was sitting in a cafe feeling anxious and nervous about the long surgery. And while she was sitting there, a Coldplay song came on. And because of their love for this music, she said that in that moment, she felt like everything was going to be okay. I've worked with so many stroke survivors who talk about feeling like they are half a person and all they want throughout their difficult rehabilitation journey is to feel as they did before the stroke. They want to be recognised as themselves, who they are, and not be defined by their stroke. Listening to and creating music helps us to get through tough times. It's, it, it connects us to our loved ones. It's enjoyable and heartbreaking all at once. It is the ultimate human experience. Yet, when people need it most, after experiencing something that they never saw coming, music is rarely offered, nor is it prioritised. And so it is time to break it. It is time to break this mould of what has been done in years gone by. It is time to empower stroke survivors by giving them access to music therapy throughout their difficult rehabilitation journey.